Hello, and welcome to the final episode of Exploring Global Problems, Series 1, a podcast where we talk to academics from Swansea University whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges from health innovation to sustainable futures and the environment, from digital technologies to clean energy. My name is Sam Blacksland, and today I'm joined by Rory Wilson, Professor of Zoology in the College of Science at Swansea University. He researches the behaviour of animals, monitoring their well-being and using tracking data to prevent extinction from poaching. He was recently granted a prestigious Humboldt Research Award and the BBC have named him as one of its top 50 conservation heroes. Rory, welcome to Exploring Global Problems. Good to see you. Thank you. To begin, could you just outline for us the global challenges that motivate your research? I suppose the most important thing is if you you go anywhere and you get your, your critical thinking on and you look around you realize that there's a a large number of people around and a large number of things that people need for their life so there's roads there's buildings there's all these type of of things that we need Uh, and we tend to sort of say yeah well london's london and uh, we've got a bit of countryside but in fact we're encroaching across the planet on wildlife and um basically that's the problem that we're trying to deal with because wildlife is compromised by this so too many humans in what was previously you know, natural territory. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, and, and some of the things are dramatic, like a major city, that's dramatic. But some of them can be ostensibly not so dramatic, like a pipeline. Mm. Um, and animals uh, who might, uh, the, the, might be migrating across that pipeline normally get to the pipeline and say, well, I'm not going over that. And so suddenly you cut a whole migration route out, that sort of thing. Okay. Um, yeah, so broadly, how do humans disrupt um, the, the lives of animals they build things that they want a lot of concrete for example they build high buildings so you get migrating birds at, at night that fly into the buildings and die that's the part of the building part but also we do things like we have agriculture we need food so we completely transform the environment so what would might be a woodland or a heathland or something we say oh, we're going to grow wheat or something else on that so all the species that might be interested in living in a wood say well what, what, what are we going to do now that sort of thing so almost everything you can think of and that ranges from uh, wind turbines to mm. generate electricity and stuff like that um, almost anything you can think of uh, is going to impact animals yeah i didn't realize until recently just how um destructive wind turbines can be for birds you know they you see decapitated seagulls etc around wind turbines quite a lot don't you yeah yeah and the, and the point about it is is that a wind turbine i've watched kites um mm. the bird kites mm. uh, flying right up to wind turbines. They haven't evolved with wind turbines, so a lot of them don't know what to do. They don't have a mechanism to deal with it. But right up to it, without realising that you that blade hits you, it'll ruin your whole day. And, you know, a lot of these take a very long time to breed. So um, if the population is going to be stable, each individual eagle will just have to reproduce once in its life. But, you know, hit by a wind turbine, and it's not going to be re- reduce, reproducing anymore. So that sort of thing is really important. Do species alter their behaviour around humans and human activity? Well, that's a big question that we're (laughs) trying to answer. But a classic example is um, roads. Uh, If you, in Germany, for example, there's a a patrol that goes every morning up to, uh, along the motorways at five o'clock in the morning, and they pick all the carcasses up and they chuck them in the back of a truck. They just carcass after carcass. Um, that means all those animals have been killed. The big question is, how, what proportion have been killed? What, what do the others that haven't been killed do? Do they avoid roads? Do they dither around them? Or, or all, all these sort of things. So um, there's huge impacts, and we're interested in knowing what animals do. Um, roads is a classic example. What do animals do when they get to roads? You know, does a badger spend half an hour trying to cross? Does it just walk across stupidly and get hit by the next car? What happens? And if we're trying to protect or look after badgers, well, what do we have to do to to uh, sort that out. This is quite a specific question. You might not know uh, the answer to or have a precise answer for it, but what percentage of the Earth's land surface is actually urban or has been developed by humans? I don't know the specific answer to that, but I can tell you this, and that is anybody who flies, depending where you fly, there, if you fly over Europe, you can go over the Netherlands, for example, at night, and you just just light everywhere. If you, if you look at these pictures of the globe at night, it's a very good way of assessing high densities of people. That doesn't cover the agriculture as well, normally. I mean, mm. in, in the Netherlands, they light up their greenhouses, actually. So it's really, you just see wall-to-wall um, light. Um, and then 
and it's sort of uh, good for the soul if you fly to Japan, you fly over sort of uh, northern Russia, and it's just miles and miles of beautiful sort of tundra, and, and you think, oh, it's not as bad as you think. But actually, um, a really substantial proportion of the Earth's surface is covered by people and their, and their stuff. And how has that increased, or at what rate has that increased, say, in the last few decades, or, I don't know, since the Second World War or something like that? Well, you know, it's, it's, it increases in proportion to the population size. Mm. So, if you know, I can, when I was at school, people were talking about, you know, we're going to reach 2 billion people, and now it's 7 billion. Mm. You know, I mean, that's, you know, there's no way we can, we can be here and not leave a footprint. But if we're smart about it, we have to try and reduce this footprint. I know we'll come on to talk in a second about um, the effect this has on wildlife, mm. etc. But I suppose some people might say that looking at, you know, light pollution, and, I, and I've seen it when you when you fly, that does mean, doesn't it, that people have actually got access to things like electricity, which is good for them. It means that people are living probably more comfortably than they would have done. Mm. So, do, do you see positives and negatives when you look? You know, I, I've actually seen pictures of the world where I think it's between 1970 and now, and and now it just looks so much brighter and there are more lights. Yeah. But that does just mean, doesn't it, that people in say the continent of Africa have they actually have electricity and probably a higher standard of life than they did before. Yeah, I, I'm not advocating that people's standard of life mm. uh, becomes horrible, mm. uh, but smart thinking is a really is a really important thing. And one of the things, for example, I don't understand. I do not understand why when solar panels are so good and everyone has to have a roof on their house anyway, I do not understand why we don't have more solar panels around. I mean, we build wind farms all over the ocean, uh, harvesting energy in a place where we're not, and we somehow have to get it back to the land when everybody's in a house with a roof. Um, I've, in the house we had in Germany had, had solar collectors on it, and it was absolutely incredible. So why aren't we all doing that? You know, I don't understand. So it's about smart decisions, um, not that everyone has a miserable time, but smart decisions that help protect the environment. Mm. Some people down here in Swansea might say there's a lack of um, sun for the solar panels, but that's probably, <laughs> well, another, uh, that's probably another discussion. But, yeah, the, well, I mean, the thing about it is the sun comes up and goes down, whether it's behind clouds or not. Actually, it, it makes a difference to the intensity of the sunlight, but it still comes up and down and you still can recoup that energy. So, yeah. Okay, let's talk about your research and the um, the tracking of animal movements. So how do you go about this? Yeah, well, what we do, where we specialise in, in, our, in our research group, which is SLAM, Swansea Lab for Animal Movement, is we specialise in really smart technology on animals. So in, in everybody understands you can have accelerometers in your, in your Fitbit, uh, in, even in your phone. How many steps have you done per day? But this is like a very sophisticated high-tech version of that. So we have uh, systems that we put on animals, and importantly, they record continuously whatever the animal does so typically 400 data points every second about the way the animal's moving and it's not just position it's uh the way the way the steps are made and uh uh lefts and rights and and uh, a whole pile of things like that temperature and pressure um and this technology is developed at swansea um and very clever software also developed at swansea i mean i wish i could say it was me um, but it's not, it's other people, <laughs> clever people that have done this beautiful software. And, and it's an incredible thing to take an animal and then you plonk a tag on it and they, they're pretty small now. And the animal goes and does its thing. And it can be a, a whale shark, which is diving to a mile underwater, or it can be a condor, which is flying a mile in the sky and it goes away. Uh, and then you recover your tag. You have to recover it. It's not always the easiest thing to do. And then, um, you can interpret this data and it's as if you've got a, a film. It's as if you've got a camera on your animal at all times. You can say, oh, it's doing this, it's doing that, and so on and so forth. So an incredible window into their lives, no matter what the conditions. So one tag mm. um, placed anywhere on the body? We like it to be placed sort of fairly centrally. So uh, the back, for example, if we put them on birds, we put them on the back or a sort of collar type area for, for mammals or or on the fin if it's a shark. So if you put a, if you put a tag, and this is relevant if you think about wearables for humans where should you put a smart tag because we also work on humans where should you put a smart tag on a human if you want to know about the human movement you're not going to put a fitbit on the end of your scarf you know what i mean because <laughs> then you get you know, twenty thousand steps per day or something or 200,000 steps because it's flapping in the wind you put it on the wrist or you put it on the body so we try and put it somewhere um, most useful and without getting too techy about this how sophisticated is the technology how does it work 
it's based on, without being too technical, it was based on using accelerometers, which do change in uh, speed, have your animals change in speed. So we can, we can see the animal's uh, body posture um, when it changes. So uh, you, you could put it on you, for example, and when you stand up from the chair and walk, we could count the number of steps and the direction you've walked and uh, that you've gone out of the door. And then and, uh, we, can, we can use acceleration proxies for doing energy expenditure. So, which is a sort of more sophisticated version of what you get from the Fitbit, and uh, and we can we use a process which is really important called dead reckoning. Everyone thinks of in terms of GPS, but that's because mm. we're people, and GPS works pretty well for people because we always live in environments where, or nearly always, where you have contact with the satellites. But if you're uh, um, talking about fish or penguins or something, and they're underwater, then there's no contact with a GPS satellite. So, so we can reconstruct the movements of animals using the heading they take, the speed they swim at, for example, and then the dive angle and the depth and so on. So we can, we can have a really, uh, a really detailed picture of these animals' movements over time using this sort of technology. Yeah. And what are you hoping to achieve by gathering all this data? Well, the, you know, the questions are different for the different species or for the different uh, areas. The, the, it's, it's about gathering useful information. The interesting thing about this sort of technology is you can gather a lot of information that appears not to be useful as well when you're gathering it. But later you say, oh, we wish we'd done that. But actually, you have. Um, so it can be information that, for example, tells us, well, how much time does a badger dither around with a, at, at a road before it crosses? And when it crosses the road, does it run across? Does it go obliquely across? Does it saunter across? Does it change when a car's there? All these sort of things. So, so that's that's a prime example. It can be well, what areas are are soaring birds using for migrating and saying, oh, they're using these hilltops, and then we can say to people, can you not put a wind turbine up there because you know, it can take a lot of birds up by doing that. So it very much depends on the question. Where have you gone with this research, or where has your team taken it? What countries? What oh, we, species oh, are we're global. We're yeah. absolutely global. So um, this type of research has been used all over the world. You, you think of a place, and we've probably been working in there. Someone said to me the other day, "How many different species have you had this sort of technology on?" And this was so maybe five years ago, and it was seventy species at the time. So so it's really broad and and broad across animal types. So we've got you know it can be. Birds like albatrosses, which are very hard to study otherwise, um, or elephants. It can be sloths. It can be you know, like sharks. It can be you know you name it. I mean, we've, we, it could be tortoises. And actually, interesting. That's an interesting point. Is um, one of the things about this technology is the sensors are so good that they're they're better than the human eye in in many cases. So in other words, uh, here's an interesting thing: you can look at an animal. You can say, "This is I can it, uh, I can see it's an elephant and it's walking." Right, um, you put a sensor on on the animal, and these sensors are physical sensors for acceleration and, and magnetometry and stuff like this. And you can determine that it's walking in a different way if it's uh, feeling upbeat and positive. I have to say this carefully because you can offend a lot of zoologists, or downbeat and less positive. So uh, we did a study where we had these tags on elephants, and and you can say the elephant's in a what they what you call a positive state when it's moving towards something it likes, so food or a bath or something like that, um, and a negative state when it's moving away from that because it's been chased away by the matriarch or something. Uh, and we can see there are differences in the signals. Uh, but to me, an elephant walking is an elephant walking. But the tag says no. You know, you get the right visualization, you can see there are differences. And so the question is, well, can we put these tags on elephants in the wild and and see where what areas bother them or where they're getting stressed or this type of thing. So, so it's uh, fabulous. Uh, the potential is huge. How do the elephants move differently? To, to ask a very specific question. Well, uh, what it, it's quite interesting because I can't see any difference with the eye. Sure. Um, but what the tags tell us is something we actually know from humans. If you, if you, I do this at airports. You watch people walking past, and you can tell everything. You know, they in good mood, and they sort of everything's going well, and they've got spring in their step and bounce, and that's a positive person. And so the acceleration signals come out really bing, 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 really bouncy, and and, and the posture's upright. Um, and when people are, uh, you know, oh, hate my life sort of thing, they they stoop and they and they they drag their feet much more. And exactly the same is true of elephants, although um, the differences are much smaller. And therefore, you can't, I can't see it with the naked eye. But the tag says, yeah, well, these are really clear differences. You just do a particular visualization and you can see it. And you sort of mentioned that 
it was worth doing this because you can tell maybe when an elephant is uh, happy to be somewhere or in a more comfortable state somewhere. But how can we practically apply this in the in the real world? What could this be useful for? It can be useful for things like saying how much we affect the animals. I mean, Ian Douglas Hamilton, who's worked with elephants for forty something years, said, "I'd love to know where elephants are bothered." Um, and he said there are areas elephants. He said they do have a good memory. It's not just urban myth. And he said that they're walking through areas that have been war torn. And he said, I'm convinced they're bothered by, they're stressed by that. Can you demonstrate that? Uh, and if that's the case, what can we do to make their lives easier? Or another case would be it, the animals don't have to be wild animals. If you want to um, have eggs from happy chickens, are they really that happy? You know, um, I'd like to buy happy eggs. And, mm. and, and this sort of technology can say, well, actually, these were happy chickens sort of thing. So um, livestock, uh, that sort of thing is uh, eminently doable. As you're talking, I'm thinking, yes, you know, happy chickens. Mm. You want to buy mm. um, uh, free range or yeah. you know, uh, uh, eggs that are ethically sourced. Mm. And ditto elephants. I love the idea mm. of elephants. I'd love to see elephants in the mm. wild. It, does this underpin some of your research, do you think, that people are very receptive to animals and actually to thinking that animals are um, not distressed? Yeah, well, exactly. It's, you know, people say, well, to what extent animals are sentient beings? So mm. how much do they feel? Mm. And, you know, a, a lot of hardcore scientists will say, oh, a dog can't feel anything. It's really hard. It's really hard when you see a dog that's off its head with excitement to say it's not, you know, it's not feeling excited. It is. And, and so the extent to which it can express that emotion is, 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 an, is a thing. But we should be treating animals well. And we obviously want them to be as, as happy as, as we can. So um, this is the this, part of this is the real cutting edge and what this technology can do is, um, and it's the sort of thing we're looking at now, to what extent can we say, how stressed, how happy, how um, bothered are animals by certain things that we do. And I will come back to talking about the technology, but you use happy there in inverted commas. That's because uh, in terms of zoological language, we can't sort of apply human emotions to animals. Yeah, Is that yeah. correct? I sort of feel it's a little bit like Victorian times where, where you know, in Victorian times, people used to say, oh, women, they're just good for the kitchen sort of thing. And now everyone says, of course, they're not. Just, you know, that's ridiculous. I sort of feel that, um, we'll get to a place where people, will, they say, oh, animals, they can't feel happy. And then uh, at an appropriate time, people will say, well, we accept that they can feel happy. So um, that's, you know, it's, it's glaringly obvious, except that it's really difficult. Um, you can say to women, how are you feeling? Or to humans, how are you feeling? And they'll say, I feel miffed because, you know, that's a, but you can't say that to an animal. So there's never any um, hardcore case for you saying, um, well, they definitely feel better because they've written it down in a letter to me. Um, and that's one of the problems. But I, I feel that in, in a couple of decades, people will be accepting that. And it'll, well, they'll look back to the way scientists think today and they'll say, you know, of, of course, they were so primitive just thinking that. But is, is, there a, is there a reluctance to use sort of the language of human emotion and apply them to animals? Though? Definitely. Yes. And definitely. And, and uh, so biologically people tend to talk about affective state i see so they say a positive affective state or a negative affective state and that's safe and, and but of course if you talk about animals generally from bacteria up to say elephants then obviously uh, as the animal becomes more sophisticated or dolphins or something and people understand some of these animals are really sophisticated the chances that they're feeling more sophisticated emotions just get bigger so it, it doesn't have to be is us and them, which is what a lot of people tend to regard it, uh, regard the animal situation as. It's just, well, how much, uh, how sophisticated are they and what breadth of emotions are they able to feel? Have you got a favourite animal that you've worked with? Oh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a penguin specialist. So, uh, you know, and I've worked with penguins for 40 years, over 40 years now. Uh, is that right? Anyway, a long time. Yeah. Uh, and my favourite penguin is the chinstrap penguin, which is, just magnificent you need i mean they're just they're full of you know they're beautiful looking birds they live in antarctica um they've got tons of character they're really feisty um and uh you know i don't think there's an animal on the planet to touch chin chin stuck penguin but you know that's me um just describe them for us they relatively big relatively small for about penguins. three kilograms so you know about this high about, about um, two foot yeah, yeah, two foot height, perhaps not even. Mm. Um, and they've got the, the, the classic uh, black on the back and white on the belly, but they've got a white face and they've got a, a, like a strap, like a chin strap, like a, like a policeman underneath. But they're just, you know, it's their character that, you know, the way they walk, 
You know, they've they've just got a bit cheeky, sass, oh, cheeky. Sassy. Sassy. <laughs> you know, they do, it's nice to. It's you know when you work with animals, uh, one of the issues is, and, and maybe we'll talk about it, but is is how you equip an animal uh, with a tag without upsetting it. Mm. Um, no, we will talk about that. Um, and and chinstrap penguins say, "Bring it on, bring it on." You know, I'm a you know, you want to put a tag on me? Good luck with that. You know, sort of thing. And then you put a tag on them, and they and they'll give you a hard time, and then you put them back because they we equip them at the nest. I take them off the nest, equip them, put them back on the nest, and then they'll swear and blind at you and they'll sit on the nest and say, just try that again. Actually, they've got the tag on by that time. But anyway. I will come to the the difficulties and actually the practicalities of of, of this work. But um, yeah, I've, the, the, the penguins in particular, yeah. does this mean that you have to go into the field? Quite oh, a yeah. Lot? oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I mean, you're in Antarctica uh, uh, regularly. I, I'm, I've been in Antarctica quite a few times. I'm At the moment, my most of my penguin works in Argentina, actually. It's, it's little known, or at least in the UK, it's little known that there are penguins in South Africa, Argentina, Chile, Peru even, and the Galapagos and Australia. And, uh, so there's plenty of actually more temperate species of penguins um, than there are pure Antarctic species of penguins. And the nice thing about working with the Magellanic penguin, which is the one I work with in Argentina, is you just fly in. You leave, you leave the country 24 hours later. You're in a colony. You're working in shorts and a T-shirt. You've got 300,000 birds to choose from. It's absolutely glorious. I've seen a video of you trying to deliver a piece to camera or, or you're being interviewed or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And you're being constantly interrupted by yeah. these penguins. Yeah. Uh, were they chin strap penguins? No, no, that's Magellanics. And, oh, okay. and to be fair, I was interrupted. I also told the BBC, I said, this is never going to work. <laughs> because they, you know, it was, a, it was in the evening. They like that because, the, you know, when you're filming, it's the golden light, as they call it. The evening is the time when the, all the partners are coming back. And so all the birds that are guarding the nest are shouting. They're saying, George! George or you know <laughs> Matilda, where are you? You know, and it's just going to happen. So we did what we could, but uh, yeah, but it didn't work. No, it didn't work. On the specific case of the penguins, what are you trying to analyse there in terms of their behaviour? Well, there's different issues with different penguins, but the Magellanic penguins. One of the things we're looking at uh, is the rate at which they get food, and it's a it's an extraordinary thing that. We all understand how important food is to us, and we all actually understand how important it is to animals. But we have really very little data on how often animals find food, the quality of that food, and and what what it means for them. And and penguins, the Magellanic penguins, are exposed to pretty different prey conditions. They take um, uh, pelagic school fish, so like anchovies, in the north, and they take uh, another type of fish in the south. And when things get bad, they, they're bad, they take squid. And so the, the coming and going of the different food stocks, which is affected by fishing and all this type of thing, is something that has a profound effect on, on their ability to breed and on their well-being and so on. So one of the most important things for me is to figure out this energy balance. You talk about humans and people doing you know, diets and exercise, and there's energy in and there's energy out, and actually that works really, you know, that works just the same for animals, and it's really important. If they get to a stage where the energy in isn't enough for them to breed properly, then uh, their population can suffer. In this series, we've talked to quite a lot of people who um, have to, to travel abroad for their research. Yeah. And so um, I always just ask this quick question. Mm. I throw this one in, which is that you're obviously in the field quite a lot. Um, I assume that requires a lot of aeroplane travel. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, yeah. I have to get there. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Uh, any conflicts in your mind with that? Because I mean, I've actually, the people who I've interviewed so far who do the most aeroplane travel seem to be working in the fields of climate change. Yeah, no, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And and actually, it's sort of the way I see it is um, it's well. I'll give you an example. When I was in Germany, um, we were doing a project on wandering albatrosses, and for this project, we were having to uh, find out about food acquisition by wandering albatrosses because the population of wandering albatrosses was crashing. Uh, and it looked like they were going to go extinct by 2027 at the rate it was going down. It was something to do with man. don't know what, but something to do with man. Um, and so I had some um, housings for our sensors, which are temperature sensors made, in, uh, made by a company within the, the, in Kiel in Germany. And I went to pick them up, and a lady who was working at the company came to me. And she said, do you know what? She said, you are an animal torturer because you are give, you're, you're giving these to albatrosses um, to to uh and, and they don't want them and i said have you got a moment to just talk about this she said you're a torturer you're a you know and and eventually she calmed down a little bit and i said 
Um, let me just tell you this. Yes, I will be taking these albatrosses and I will be giving them this pill that will swallow it and the pill will record every time they eat something because the temperature is going to go down and then I can recover the pill when they come back and, and uh, then we'll know. Um, and I said, but let me tell you this, that you know the population of these albatrosses is going down. Our extrapolations are that it'll be extinct by 2027. I'm asking you, this, the work we're doing is unquestionably unpleasant for these albatrosses. They're not going to die. They, they, it's not the pill swallowing they don't like. It's being picked up by me they don't like. So there's this discomfort. There's the, you're doing things that are not good for that albatross, or it's like flying. You're not good for the environment. But the ultimate aim is to find out what's happening so that those can be uh, protected. And I said, I'm asking you now, if we don't do this and we just leave it, because we've messed up, messed up the system so much, um, would you be happy for me not to do it? And then they can go extinct in 2027 20, and your grandchildren won't know, they won't have wandering albatrosses in the environment. And, or, or should I go and mess with the albatrosses? And you say, oh, no, no, please go and mess with the albatrosses sort of thing. I said, to be perfectly honest, and this is how, you know, again, you can see this in air travel in the same way. To be perfectly honest, if I had to take some wandering albatrosses and actually kill them to guarantee the survival of the species, I would do it. So it's a greater good thing. So it's a greater good thing. Yeah. Which leads me on to actually thinking about the practicalities of mm. tagging these animals yeah. or giving them the pills or whatever. Um, yes, they're going to be in some distress at some point, I assume. Yeah. But how do you minimise that distress? Well, I, and I, you know, this is a really important thing, and, I, and I've published on this recently, is that the stress that an animal feels from tags is, is sort of twofold. One from the tag itself, which can you know, weigh it down or increase its drag if it's a flying bird. And, and, and there's a lot of work we can do to minimize that by having really small tags and so on and so forth. Uh, but the other thing, and this is a really big deal, is, is actually capture, capturing those animals. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, if you get caught and restrained, if you're a wild animal, that's, you may as well be eaten. That's what happens just before you get eaten. And so there's a biological justification of being stressed out of your bonds. If, if that happens. Sure. And so this, it, it doesn't matter whether you're bird ringing or whether you're putting a tag on an animal, actually to restrain an animal is a really, really big deal. Um, there are, uh, and we still do that to put the tags on animals. We try and, uh, we have all sorts of methods to try and minimize that stress. Um, sometimes we use sedatives, the big, big animals, you know, South American sea lions. I mean, they're not called lions for nothing. They've just got the head that's like this and big teeth and, you know, you know, you can say goodbye to life as you knew it if you <laughs> mess with those in the wrong way. So sedation is one way of doing it. But sedatives aren't always that good either because, you know, animals feel it's like us after an operation. You'd feel all groggy and you don't mm. want that. Um, so there's, there's expertise in uh, people capturing wild animals. Like I've worked with penguins so long, I, can, I reckon I can equip a penguin with all very minimal stress for the animal. And I don't use sedatives because you can just take them off the nest and you do it properly. The penguin knows. Oh, he knows what he's doing. I may as well just hang around. Um, sedatives. And then the extreme case is where, like when we study whale sharks in, mm. in Australia, and these are animals that can be up to 20 metres long, you're obviously not going to chuck some bread out, attract it to your bait and then plonk it on the boat and then say, oh, we'll put a tag on this. You can't do that. It's just too big. So you're in the water with the tag and this whale shark swims past you and then you've got to put the tag on its fin as it swims past. And so that animal is not restrained. And interestingly, sometimes the process of actually putting the tag on the fin, they go, Hoo! you know, mm. but most of the time they don't do anything. And so we're actually working on a new system, a completely new system now, which is seeing how much we can, the extent to which we can tag animals without restraining them. So uh, this is all hot off the press, um, but anyway, I'll say it, whatever. And that is, for example, having a system whereby you want to, you want to tag a fox and there'll be a, it's going to go through a hedge and you can say, well, it's going to push through the hedge um, and we can have a little thing where the tag, as it goes through the hedge, goes and gets stuck on its back. Uh, and we, uh, the first attempt we're, we're looking at is using, rather than glue, to put, stick it on with fur, like burrs, you know, these like goose grass and stuff oh, yeah. like that. We put that on the underneath the tag. It, stick, it goes on the fox. Fox will romp around with it for a few days and then it'll drop off. Um, and then we'll pick it up because we'll get a signal from the VHF or something it's carrying. The important thing to remember is that that might not be ideal because we would like the tag to be on for, uh, for a little bit longer. But in no, under no uh, conditions is that animal restrained. And so it pushes through the hedge and, and probably won't pick anything up, up, you know, won't feel anything more than just pushing through a hedge at all. 
Uh, and so if we can get that right and we can modify it for a lot of different animals, we're really, really winning because then this restraint, capture and restraint issue sort of goes away. So people might have heard it here first. That you're oh, no, they would. No, definitely. Uh, definitely. We're doing it right now and they would have heard it here first. Brilliant. Have you ever got into any scrapes personally with animals in trying to restrain them? Uh, yeah. Yes, definitely. I mean, I... Um, the, it, sometimes the animals you're trying to equip, it's quite often the animals you're not equipping that are more dangerous because you have a protocol for doing them. And, and you know, I never, I never get bit by the penguin I'm actually handling. It's just the polar bear behind you. Well, well, the, well, that's, that, well, that sort of thing. Or another penguin. So, so you're in the, in the colony and you're sort of trying to get the penguin here and you put your hand over there and there's another penguin over yes. there. And it says, oh, it's a hand. I'll bite that, <laughs> you know, uh, reasonably enough. So there's that, or, or I, I, I'm acutely aware of, uh, of other things in the environment. I don't really like working in tropical rainforests because they're full of snakes and mm -hmm. stuff like that. You know, and, I, and actually when I was doing a project uh, with Luca Berga and that we were in Brazil in the tropical rainforest there on um, golden lion tamarinds, which are sort of monkeys, and uh, we came in and we were going through this forest and I was thinking, snake, snake. I think it's wise to think of snakes in a place that has lots of snakes. Uh, and we were walking through the forest in single file. Uh, and I was in the third position. Um, and anyway, we walked through the day. It was fine like that. Um, and then in the evening, there was the guru, the tropical rainforest guru who was with us. And I said, you can, can tell me about snakes um, uh, here and, you know, what the chances of us. Uh, and I expected him to say, well, if you move through the forest in this way and you sing this song, then the snakes will all dissolve in front of you. And, and he said, oh, I really hate them. I hate them. They're everywhere. They're on the ground. They're in the trees. <laughs> uh, and, he, and he said, and actually the thing to do is never be in the third position in a single file. And I said, why is that? He said, well, that, the tradition says the first person irritates, who wakes the snake up, the second person irritates it, and it bites the third. And so I was in a real conflict the next day where I put myself in this thing. And I decided the best way was to say to people, look, we've got this situation. Anyone want to be in the third position? So, yeah, it's mainly the animals... Um, your, that you're not expecting. You're not expecting that are more of a problem. Understood. Let's talk about poaching because mm. you do work a lot in that area, don't you? Mm. Or, or this broader project is designed to actually mm. you know, deal with and solve this big issue. Yeah. Well, we're st uh, the, the thing we're doing at the moment, which is a new, uh, a new approach, is to try and put tags on animals so that we can detect poaching. So there's a project going in, uh, in Madagascar, uh, and there's, there's a tortoise called the plowshare tortoise, which is the rarest tortoise on the planet, um, and they sell for $50,000 each. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. Uh, it's incredible. And the, the thing about that mean, is that if you work in Madagascar and your wage is $22 a month uh, and you get a chance as a local to have something that's going to, to sell on the black market, something that's going to give you a mansion by Madagascan standards, um, then why wouldn't you do it? It's only a tortoise after all. And so that's the sort of thing that leads to extinction. So we have had a project that's been going on and the idea behind it, we've done the first stage in this, is so the tortoise wears an ultra miniature tag and uh, and this tag sits there and says, am I being poached? Am I being poached? Am I being poached? Am I being... And then it, the tortoise does something that tortoises don't normally do, which is get picked up. Mm. And it says, I'm being poached. Uh, I will recognize that and it will immediately send a signal to um, to the rangers to say I'm being poached and they can come and try and apprehend the person. Um, we're in the first stages that we've done the first uh, trials to, to say, well, what sort of signal do we need? But that's the sort of approach that I think will be increasingly used on on rare animals. Um, and there are more difficult ones like rhinos. We were talking about a rhino study and you say, well, can you put a tag on a rhino so that when the, when the rhino is about to be poached it does stuff in its behavior that's not normal of, and and it can do the same thing because it's, it's the easiest thing in the world to put a tag on and say this animal's suddenly been shot but it's too late sure um, so so yeah challenging so with the with the tortoise example it's literally a case of they are suddenly moving much faster i guess than they normally would because they've been picked up yeah but you can also analyze the very subtle movements and behaviours in something like an elephant, I guess, if we yeah. to go back to that example. Exactly. So yeah. the, the, the elephant type example or the rhino type example yeah. is much more sophisticated where you would have to say the software on the tag would have to say, this is not normal behaviour. This is what elephants or rhinos do when people are around. Where are you trialling this? 
Um, the elephant stuff, um, we're just starting with elephants. Now, actually, in fact, there's a project going uh, on in Kenya and looking at uh, or starting on uh, crop raiding in elephants. So that's, that's not a poaching issue, but it is a human wildlife conflict issue. And, there's, and, and you, get, you get issues in, in the world which are to do with, um, okay, animals being compromised by people and people don't know or they don't care. And, and then there's other cases where people really care because an elephant comes into your backyard and trashes it. And obviously that's not great. We have baboons in South Africa do the similar, similar sort of thing. So um, and it's quite difficult to persuade an elephant that's walked into your field of maize to not eat the maize, you know, what are you going to do? Um, and so uh, there's, there's a project being started there where we say, well, can we tell when they're going to crop raid? You can, and where they are, and if their behavior is indicative of that. We do know that um, in, in elephant dung, for example, an elephant that's going to crop raid, for example, is, is, has higher levels of stress hormones in the dung. That's too late. You know, by the time you've got out the next morning, it says, oh, it's a crop raiding, and it's, you know, um, we're wondering if we can have tags on the animals that will then say this animal in three hours will be about will crop rate because it's already getting hyped up thinking about it mm. aside from the tortoise that you mentioned mm. what other species do you work with that are critically endangered um most or even of, quite endangered yeah quite endangered well i mean the the it's it's an interesting thing what you know what's classified as endangered mm. uh threatened near threatened uh and some of the uh some of the things that have been said about animals about being endangered or threatened and so on, I, I don't necessarily agree with. I mean, the Magellanic penguin, which I, is, if you look it up in the IUCN, they'll say near threatened. That, that bird is nowhere near threatened. There's two million Magellanic penguins. You know, they're right round from Argentina, Falklands, up into Chile, all over the place. What's threatened about that? The population's not going down. And so to say something's critically endangered or endangered, is, a, is an issue in itself. We tend not to work with, like the plowshare tortoise is perhaps the most extreme example we've, we've worked with. We tend to not to work with animals that are that critically endangered, certainly to begin with, because um, you don't want to be working in, with an animal where there's only a hundred of them and mess it up. You know or, I mean? or drawing attention to them. Yeah, or drawing yeah. attention to it. You don't want to have a system where you say, we know where our animals are at all times. And then with the uh, the ubiquity, uh, ubiquity of the web for poachers to say, oh, well, right, well, you know, we're going to go and do that. So some of our stuff is, is also linked uh, to studying animals that aren't so rare or our population is decreasing. Like the South African, the penguin in South Africa, the African penguin. Um, and when I, I did my PhD on that bird and there were, it, it's terrifying how much the population has gone down. I worked on an island. I was there for a full year by myself. And that island had 14,000 penguins on it. And I was studying at the time because they said um, the population's uh, going down, crashing. We don't know why. It's something to do with what goes on at sea. Uh, and I went back five years ago to that island for the first time for, for years. And there was one penguin on that island, one. Um, and one of the big problems, even at the time I was doing my PhD, was they say the population's crashing, but no one could say, what is the norm? What is the norm for African penguins? I could measure it at the time, but I didn't know what. You know, and so some of the studies we're doing in the Magellanic Penguins, the example is what is the norm? It's all okay now, but in twenty years' time, if there's oil spills and overfishing and da da da, we can say, well, this is what's expected for this bird to be able to do well. So it's not even just a case of saying this animal's about to die; we need to do it urgently. Although that's true, um, understanding animal needs is a really important thing. I I love animals so much that I can't even read about animals in distress or you know being yeah. poached without sort of having to stop looking at the newspaper or whatever. Yeah. Can your work sometimes be distressing? Oh, without question, it can be distressing. But to be some of the most depressing or distressing parts about animals is the stuff that goes on, and we're completely oblivious to it. Everyday stuff that goes on. You know, the example of a of an animal crossing the road is one. I mean, are they are they really stressed by cars going past? You might say, well, I'm a, I'm a good citizen. I drive an electric car. I do this. You, you might still be stressing the fox population or the cat population or the, you know or the squirrel population. I don't know. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, I, it's, it would also be true to say that the most distressing things I have seen in the wild have actually been natural phenomena, um, that occur with us or without us. So I, I, I turned up at a Nadili penguin colony in Antarctica one time and, and there were just, you know, dozens of Adili penguins, you know, partially disemboweled and all alive, still all over the, all over the snow. 
I thought, what's going on here? And I went down to where they were coming out of the water and there's a juvenile leopard seal, you know, lying in wait and it wasn't catching them properly. And so the penguin would get away and then crawl up and, you know, they, animals, wild animals are incredible at, you know, they just carry on, they just carry on. Um, and they're dragging themselves towards the nest with, with their guts hanging out. So it's, those, those sort of things are really, really tough. I can imagine. Mm. Goodness. Okay, just to shift the focus a little bit, you've talked about SLAM, which mm. is the Swansea Lab for Animal Movement. Yeah. Um, how did you set that up? What did it entail? I suppose the time when it became most uh, coherent, well, I've been using tags of one sort or another for, for years, uh, but they've got very sophisticated now. Um, and the time it became most coherent was actually when we got a grant from the Royal Society Wolfson um, lab refurbishment scheme. And we said, the interesting thing about putting high tech on animals is you can put high tech on animals and then it comes back really complicated stuff. And you say, oh, right, well, uh, I've got all the answers to what I, all my questions, but I don't understand how to get them out of it. It's all, you know, it's like Pandora's box. There's all this stuff in and I can't understand it. Uh, and so uh, we need very special ana analytical techniques to be able to look at them. And one of the things that's very important to us is visualization. And you can take uh, the data from these tags. And, and you might, an example, a month, a tag on an animal for a month, you might get a billion data points to give you an idea. So you need fast computing. You need something that's going to be, enable you to actually do the analysis. Um, and so uh, the Royal Society Wilson people, we applied for a grant. We said, will you help us do this? And they said, yeah. And so they've built a big screen and, you know, cleaned out, you know, the rooms. We've got this lovely visualization suite. And so now we have uh, students doing postgraduate work, uh, PhDs, masters and so on. And they, and they uh, work with different animals, with data from different animals from all over the world. And, and they can use this software uh, to be able to see the patterns we're interested in. And it's, it's really cool. It's really, really cool. And it would be true to say that um, I, there's, there's, software, there's no software like this anywhere else on the planet, and it's mainly due to one person. And I wonder if I can mention it, Mark Holton. Uh, I'm sure he'd be delighted if you did. Yeah, no, no, I mean, he's just great. He, he designs the tags um, and uh, effectively sends them off to be made, but it's his thinking behind them. And they're beautiful tags, and they're getting smaller and smaller. And, of course, small tags means you can... You can the animals you're studying are going to affect less, but also you can put them on smaller and smaller species. And there are many more small species than there are large species. You know, a lot more rats than there are elephants, uh, types of rat. Um, and so between that and this, um, and Mark doing the software, and and we can go to him and say, can you do it this way? And can you can you do it that way? Uh, and then uh, you have this incredible capacity to to do the analytical stuff that we need to do. And the lab is established here at yeah. the university? Yeah, in Swansea University in, in the Wallace building. So uh, and like I say, it's, it's, it's unquestionably world leading. And that's uh, because we, we were lucky enough to get the money and to get the right people together. What about other organisations that you work with, perhaps overseas? I know there's, a, there's an aquarium in Valencia, isn't there? Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, we work with, we work with, depending on the question being asked, we, we sure. work with lots of different people. Um, the aquarium in Valencia is a big aquarium, very dramatic aquarium uh, uh, with a lot of space for animals. And the, the aquarium is, they're really interested in the well-being of their animals. Um, there's a lot of uh, criticism of zoos um, or captive animals. Um, you can like them or hate them. Some zoos are obviously more generous to their, generous to animals than, than other ones, giving them more space and so on. But some of the critical things is how happy are the animals there? And, and so some of the stuff we've been looking at um, in Valencia is, well, for turtles, for example, there's, a, there's someone there doing a PhD on turtles and looking at two things. What is it that makes a turtle happy? And part of that happiness is saying, is the aquarium, the way it's been set up, allowing this turtle to do all the things or as near as possible that a wild turtle would do? So you need data on wild turtles, you need turtle, you know, turtles in these different environments in Valencia. And you could say, oh, yes, this is, this is working really well. So... Uh, and the other thing is things like rehabilitation. So Oceanographic, which is the name of the organization, rehabilitates turtles. In the, in the winter, they get lots of them turning up and with all sorts of uh, problems. Um, interestingly, things that equate to the bends, uh, like the divers' bends. Um, uh, and, and that's probably because they've been caught in a net and um, been held underwater and uh, depths they don't want to be or shouldn't be. And so they take these turtles in and they rehabilitate them and they re re release them. And so one of the projects we're looking at is if you put a tag on an animal, can you diagnose its problems by just putting a tag on it and putting it in an aquarium? And you say, well, it's got air embolism. 
or whatever it is, and, and they swim in that way when they've got air embolism. And that means that the vets that are normally looking after these people can be much more efficient. So, yeah, that mm. sort of thing. Do people ever say to you, why don't you put your energies into changing the behaviour of the humans who cause the problems that you're sometimes trying to solve rather than going to the animals directly? It's, it's, it's you know, that's, that becomes politics. Uh, and, and I've had this sort of thing levelled at me a number of times. It's like the case of the African penguin uh, where the ecosystem's overfished. Um, me personally chaining myself to the gates outside the government and saying, I'm going to stay here until you stop overfishing. Um, uh, I don't think that's the best use of the resources that, that, that I can, I, I can use. So I can, I can blip from, I can go from animal to animal or species to species. And I can put my 10 pence worth of, this is what I think is happening based on the sort of tech technology we use. And then that I believe is the truth, and then that can be used to inform other people that can chain themselves. It's not that I wouldn't chain myself, it's just I think I can be more useful by not, and just using my time doing something else. And you get to work directly with the animals. And, and which is just, which is the, the most fabulous honour. I, I never get, uh, get tired of just thinking what an honour it is for me to be able to be doing this. And, and it's so funny because you have animals you understand because you've worked with them so long, like penguins and animals, you, you, you come to a new project like sloths. And I can remember the first time I worked with sloths, I looked at these things and I just thought, I know nothing mm. about this animal. I, know, I don't even know how to begin to handle it. And you always have some sort of expert on site who'll say, oh, this is how you do it. And then, and then you learn, but you feel like a child again. Um, and in stark contrast to that, you, know, you can be in that sort of situation and you go back to your penguins and you can look at this bird on a nest and you think, I know you. You know, and it's it's an honour to, to to be able to think like that too. I used to have a book when I was a kid about sloths. Actually, you've just reminded me, and it but it's made me think that I don't know very much about them either. What kind of animals are they? They are extraordinary, extraordinary animals. They're um, obviously they're very slow. Everyone knows they're slow, but people don't know how uh, they have almost no muscle, but are incredibly strong. Right, um, and so they have twenty five percent of the muscle of a mammal of their size. So that should make them very weak, but they've got some sort of system going on so that a sloth, you know, a sloth can sort of with one hand can just sort of hang like this in a sitting crucifix position um, with apparently no effort. I mean, it's really extraordinary. There's some very strange stuff that goes on and they're, and they're <clears throat> we're starting a project with sloths actually, which is to look at how sloths in a more urban environment differ from sloths in, in a proper, you know, primary rainforest environment. And, uh, and where they go, do they move more? They're more disturbed. Um, they get electrocuted by pylons. They think, oh, here's a nice tree. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> last thought, famous last words, that sort of thing. But um, there's so many strange mysteries in sloth lives. You, you look at them and, well, the, the, the three-fingered sloth, uh, they, they're, they're, they're really slow. And then the place we were working in Costa Rica, they, they have a sloth they've had in as a sort of tame sloth. Or, uh, it could go, it could leave if it wanted. It doesn't. Um, called Buttercup and you could walk past Buttercup and Buttercup would, you'd walk past her and Buttercup would go, uh, 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 and it should be really slow following you. It should be, be behind you. And so it's a lovely thing to feel, you know, as you walk past the sloth, the sloth is, what the sloth has perceived is, whew, and that's a human gone past you. I think that was a human that went past, you know, but they're that slow. Um, but it's part of their uh, part of their lifestyle. They they eat very slowly. They eat poisonous leaves, yeah. and they digest very slowly. And so the energy they release is very very is released very slowly. And so they can't afford to gallivant around the forest like a monkey. Uh, it's too expensive. So they have to do everything really slowly. And, and do they sleep a lot, or is that a myth? Um, they certainly um, they do sleep a lot. Then yeah. they certainly are inactive for a lot of the time. Yeah. And, and that's the funny thing about it. And that's where tag technology is also so important. People think. And the classic scenario is you've got to put a tag on it. It's a tiger shark. Um, you can't see a tiger shark half the time, and therefore you need to know what it's doing. But actually animals you can see all the time, like sloths, you know, they're not doing anything for so long. You know, do you have the time to sit there and watch a sloth at the top of some tree you can barely see uh, until suddenly in the middle of the night it'll wake up and move, you know, a couple of meters? So uh, they can save you a lot of time. Rory, you obviously consider yourself very lucky to be doing what you're doing. Yeah, fabulously fortunate, yeah. Um, there are probably people listening to you. In fact, if I was listening to you 10 years ago, I'd probably yeah. be thinking, oh, how can I, how can yeah, I get into yeah, this type yeah, of work? Yeah. You know, if somebody is in that position 
a young yeah. person, perhaps still in school, um, what would you say to them or how would you encourage them to do what you're doing? When I was four, I got into penguins. You know, I was at a zoo and I said, I saw these penguins. I can remember it today, you know. And I was pulling on my mum's arm and saying, well, you know what, tell me about that. what's going on. These birds diving and disappearing, looking quite bizarre. Um, and I uh, knew that I wanted to study animals from that sort of uh, age, and actually penguins in particular. And then, and then you you do this, the, the 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 classic way is to go through it. So you do biology at school, and it's useful to do other sciences as well, because uh, you know none of these scientists sciences are actually in boxes by themselves. Biology and chemistry overlap hugely in chemistry and physics, and biology and physics. So, um, so just get yourself smart in that respect. And then I went to university and I studied zoology. And, and obviously, and, and then from, you, you, you've got this undergraduate period and then you graduate and then there's this leap to doing research, doing a PhD and then getting out there and being able to, to you'd so you really, to be able to do that with impunity, if you like, you, that's the, what you have to do. And it takes a lot of intellectual rigor, obviously, to get there in the first place. It's not just a case of working with animals. No, no, absolutely. And, 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 I, and I think that's the difficult thing is it's uh, to, to try and understand them. Um, as best you can, uh, you know, you're doing yourself a favour if you just gen up on the way systems work. Well, what a lovely way to uh, round off our, our first series, Rory. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, if you want to find out more about Rory's research, you can visit his staff profile page at Swansea University's College of Science website or search for Swansea Lab for Animal Movement. To find out more about this podcast and Swansea University's research, visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash research. That's all from us today. Thanks for listening and thank you again to our guest, Professor Rory Wilson. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate and review. I'm Sam Blacksland and that was the final episode of Exploring Global Problems Season 1 from Swansea University.